Ricardo Santiago Arroyo. He's my friend. He is presenting today on Santo Stefano of Puerto Rico. It's an old tradition that's what the author ever read before, recently. A um, little background on Carlos. He's been interested in Santo since the 1960s, thanks to a friend of the church. Um, he's always studied them, went to museums, purchased them for next to nothing, you know, $5, $10 here and there. In the 60s. In the 60s. Early 60s. Um, his interest has continued, and in 1998, he actually started carving himself, and he's done a couple workshops, and he's taught some classes, one of which I took, which was super interesting and fun. And um, he still does it throughout Southern New England and Puerto Rico. And a couple of things. I have a map of Puerto Rico with some of the prominent towns where some of those do carvings. Um, I just thought that would be helpful for reference purposes. So if you want to take one, pass it along. And also we have a sign-in sheet for Clackles. If you could also sign that, then we'll start with Google. And I will hand over to Thank you, well. Well, I'm Carlos, and good afternoon. Uh, we're going to be uh, speaking in English <coughs> and Spanish, whatever you feel like you want to that uh, uh, I, I really welcome you. Yeah. Uh, I'm very happy that you're all here and uh, me uh, speaking, thinking, looking at Santos is a big deal, the car Santos. Uh, I am not a practicing Catholic, um, but I see it more as an art form. Uh, when, uh, the island. In fact, you will see that many master uh, carvers in the island, uh, they're evangelicals, Lutherans, agnostics. Some, they don't think anything of uh, uh, saints except that they respect them. So, which tells us that uh, there has been an evolution, and we'll talk about that, and I'll talk about that with you. And also, this is going to be interactive. So. Uh, I just hope that any comments, any questions, uh, uh, you can go ahead and uh, say it. Uh, so it's not in, it is, I don't take it as an interruption, I take it more as an interjection. So there is a give and take because I'm sure that um, most of you have uh, knowledge about uh, the Santos de Palo, the, the wooden carvings. So, um, it certainly, I mean, I, I have to say that I, I really want to thank uh, the center, uh, uh, Caroline. I mean, actually, without Caroline, we couldn't have the quality of this presentation because I am not good with computers. At all. <laughs> uh, uh, and also, in a very special way, I really want to uh, express my gratitude to Mary. Uh, my friend and wife yeah, who have always helped me so much in the, in the middle of all these anxieties that I get into and she just keeps floating so gracias <laughs> uh, muchacha so is there is anyone here who does not speak uh, Spanish I just want oh <laughs> hey oh, more power to you <laughs> no that's okay no, we'll, I'll continue in English. What I'm going to do is, um, uh, later we're going to be more specific about the Santos and why this chronology that I have here and different uh, corners. I, I try not to bring too many because this, this can become overwhelming and perhaps I did but uh, we, we will see, we will see as we move along. Um, here, the way we're going to be working out is that I'm going to be speaking and uh, Caroline will be moving the uh, slides. Uh, so, um, well, I, I better start. So, <laughs> we're going to see an end to it, too. Uh, I'm going to sit um, for some of the time, and sometimes I'm going to move around. Um, and I want to start with uh, just a historical context. And from that, I'm talking about uh, the 1940s, uh, 1993 to be more exact. And we're going to be, uh, we're going to be talking about 
I don't know, until the 1600s. It's just a brief segment uh, to have an idea uh, in general as to uh, what had been happening uh, in the island. And all that I say, although it's historical or it's political, you will see that it is always connected to Santos. It's not, whatever I talk about it, it has to do with something that happened uh, uh, with the Santos uh, in the island. Uh, yeah, of course, uh, the Spaniards, uh, Colombo, uh, from Genoa, Italia, um, uh, encountered the, the Taino Indians. Uh, it's almost one can say that the Tainos discovered Christopher Columbus, you know. Uh, here we have an idealized uh, um, rendering of that moment. And uh, next, uh, the next uh, slide is uh, uh, Juan Ponce de Leon, who uh, was uh, the first uh, governor of Puerto Rico. Um, and he's, he spent years in the island until he went to Florida uh, looking for the fountain of youth, as we probably don't <coughs> know uh, this history. No. Uh, uh, the Tainos were Christian. Uh, of course, uh, by the monks and the priests, they, uh, we have to remember that uh, Spain in 1492 and 93, <coughs> they uh, unified as a country for the first time with Fernando and Isabel. And um, for finally, now they consider that they have now a Catholic country. And uh, in 1992, or 93, I sometimes get confused with the date, uh, all those uh, uh, Muslims who lived in, uh, Arabs who lived in, or Arab descent who lived in Spain, and they lived there for 700 years. Um, they, uh, they were asked to, if you don't convert, you, uh, uh, you have to leave the country, and many people have been lived there for, uh, hundreds and hundreds of years. And the following year was with the Jews, the same thing. They had to convert um, uh, to Catholicism. Uh, so what happened, many many left, many said that they have converted, although that actually didn't happen. Uh, and uh, the, uh, it, this came at the time when uh, Spain needed uh, uh, the brains of the Arabs and the Jews. I mean, the, the, the Arabs were the architects. Uh, they were famous for uh, their skills as architects and uh, also shepherds. Uh, and the Jews dealing with businesses. I mean, it's, uh, and at the time when uh, Spain <coughs> encountered America in 1492, so that all that brain drain without the border. So at the time when Spain was up high, eventually, because it went down because they didn't have the, the resources uh, that they had, uh, uh, that they had just two years before. Uh, the, the, the Taino Indian thing, uh, which is the indigenous population, it was uh, brutalized, um, and most of them died actually by the sword or by uh, diseases uh, brought from from Europe. Uh, then Africans were imported by uh, uh, from uh, Africa. Uh, I'm sorry, Africans were imported as slaves, and uh, also were uh, christened. Uh, uh, the evangelization. Uh, to hold uh, in, uh, in the country. Uh, it became the two forces in Spain. Uh, it, it was uh, the king and queen and Catholicism. That was uh, the union that they had. Uh, this is actually the beginning of the syncretism. Um, probably most everybody knows about syncretism, uh, what happened uh, uh, in in America in this particular time, uh, when this 
is a blend of two religions uh, take place, and um, although still they say you know they are Catholics, but you will see that uh, uh, the indigenous uh, and and also the Africans they have their own religions and they have their own uh, uh, representations of their gods, and in their syncretism, what oftentimes they did was that. They would be said that, uh, let's say, a virgin, Mary, but in reality the features were of uh, their uh, goddesses uh, in the past. Uh, uh, for them, in terms of their history, uh, uh, and uh, so he was a goddess of maternity or fertility. That was Virgin Mary, and so they all uh, were able to compensate something that he was taken away from them. Here and then, uh, when uh, we go to, uh, well, as time went by, the colonizer developed uh, an infrastructure for the everyday life in the island, uh, where Catholicism uh, was central. Uh, devotion to particular santos reflected the place of origin of uh, the Spaniards who went to the island. And for instance, we see in Puerto Rico, uh, what are the saints that we have, like in the hit parade, you know, that uh, there is a cluster of santos that you see mostly in Puerto Rico, and then when you look back at the history, you see uh, uh, that Catalonia and Galicia um, were represented in that immigration. And then for, uh, when I think of uh, Catalonia, of course, uh, we think of uh, La Virgen de Montserrat, the Lady of Montserrat, uh, and which, uh, in fact, I, I, I have it hidden here. This is the original uh, uh, Lady of Montserrat, and the reason why I wanted to show it to you, and it was not painted the way, this is in the Romanesque period, and we'll talk a little bit about that, um, but I, I want you to see just now the way you look at it and later on we'll, we'll talk more specifically um, but this virgin uh, was a patron saint of uh, Catalonia so all these Catalans who came uh, to the island including uh, priests and monks uh, uh, they, uh, they had great fervor for this virgin so when uh, uh, the lady of Montserrat uh, comes, which is, uh, Montserrat means mountains, serrated mountains, because if you go to Catalonia, Barcelona, and then even in the area where uh, Montserrat, uh, you will see the mountains are like, like you saw, serrated mountains because of the peaks that they have. And that's why it's Nuestra Señora de Montserrat. So, see. Was she black in Catalonia? Oh, yeah, just like that. It just it was found like this. Why? Uh, there is, I, I cannot answer you the, the specific reason why, but I can tell you is that there are about 10 or 12 black Madonnas in Europe. In Spain, there are others. This is not the only yeah. one. Uh, so and then in, in Hungary, in Poland, uh, and it's fascinating to see uh, how, for some reason, the features are European. You know, and then of course it's from the perspective of the Romanesque, you know, this period uh, a thousand years ago. Uh, so, but what happens when, um, I, I, I couldn't answer your question because I don't have the information you know, in specific about uh, what happened, but it, it is common in Europe to have uh, uh, black with uh, European features. Uh, but then what happens is that our lady of Montserrat, of course, uh, goes to Puerto Rico, starts eating rice and beans, and you know, taking it easy, enjoying the time, and then we never have it so thin. Look at it. Um, <laughs> of course, this is the period of uh, 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 the period of, uh, of, of Romanesque, uh, but it gives you an idea about the poem <coughs> is the same, and still is today, uh, the same uh, body language that she had is today, except that it's completely different. Then you see, I, I, I think you have a small one. Um, 
around here. Yes, here. There we go. Yeah, this one. You see, this is a miniature, uh, which, by the way, of, of uh, Lady of Montserrat. But you see, it's hefty. For the most part, it's, it's like that. It's just uh, um, uh, welfare. Uh, let me put it that way. <laughs> and uh, you will see that some of these, uh, I'm going to speak about this later, but it's important now that I have this one in, in my hand, is uh, the importance these days uh, of having miniature uh, Santos uh, art. Uh, and it is, uh, these are the collectionists uh, pushing uh, the Santo Carvers because I said, I have so many Santos and I don't have room at home <laughs> where to put them. So about 10, 15 years ago, it started this thing of uh, carving miniatures. And uh, many people excel there. And we'll talk a little bit uh, later about, about that. Uh, not only Our Lady of Montserrat, but also uh, with the Catalans, uh, 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 we had uh, San Ramon Donato, San Raymond Donato, Our Lady of Mercy, Nuestra Señora de la Merced. Uh, those are uh, the saints that prevailed at that particular time in uh, uh, Catalonia. In Galicia, uh, we're talking about Santiago, Santiago, uh, Apostle, Apostle Santiago. Um, this was at the time, again, with the Romanes, the, with the Camino de Santiago, the pilgrimage route that comes, you know, there are four routes in uh, coming down from uh, France, and they all, the four routes, they converge at the Puente de la Reina, uh, which is the, the bridge of the Queen in uh, Navarra. Spain, and from there, there is one main uh, uh, route that goes to Santiago de Compostela. Although in reality, there are also there are others, but the, there is a main one and others. There is the northern one that goes actually to uh, the region up in Asturias and continues, uh, in <coughs> which is actually Asturias, the uh, where the Romanes starts in. In, in Spain, uh, in, you will see that although um, uh, San Patricio, St. Patrick is a patron saint of the church in Loisa, in the town of Loisa, this is here, well probably everybody knows St. Patrick here, <laughs> Just, <laughs> you can help it. Uh, they, um, it is uh, actually it's in Loisa, which is uh, the town with the highest uh, uh, level of uh, uh, descendants of uh, uh, Africans in the island. Uh, and uh, so, Loisa has in the church San Patricio, St. Patrick, but then the big uh, uh, celebrations are in the summer uh, in uh, uh, July 25th, which is Santiago. Why? Because Santiago is extremely important. And here talking about syncretism, they have uh, people throughout the centuries in Loisa, they have been able to absorb uh, uh, many of uh, uh, the rituals that they had before along with the Catholic ones. Uh, in, and there we have, of course, dance and musical instruments, they play a big role. That's why we have Santiago de los Hombres, Santiago de los Caballeros, Santiago de las Mujeres, uh, and all that, it is in, only in Loisa. It's fascinating also to be there during those uh, uh, festivities, uh, July 25th and a few more days, where after the tourists leave at one o'clock in the morning, you see these old people dancing. It's uh, just really something to be seen. I mean, it's just, just lovely. Uh, and then what happened was as time went by, uh, in Puerto Rico, going back uh, to uh, the 1500s, um, there were no uh, churches or chapels, uh, in, except a few in the island. Remember that um, 
uh, Spain forgot about Puerto Rico. We were a stepping stone to go to the reaches of Mexico and the reaches of uh, South America, Peru. Um, but uh, there were some times that for years, not one uh, boat sailed from Spain to Puerto Rico to bring anything there. So Puerto Rico had to survive in, in the measure that they, that they could. Um, so basically, uh, the Puerto Ricans were ignored. Uh, and uh, what happened with that was that they began to create their own uh, ideas about um, uh, religious rituals. And something extremely important to understand here is that these rituals were separate from the official church. Why? Because they didn't have no priests or monks, uh, and eventually then nuns. So they began to create their own uh, uh, rituals, um, that has actually have continued in different celebrations. In the 20th century, things have been weakened there. It's, it's, it's a reality because of urbanization, modernism had affected that. But I know for me as a child, being able to experience uh, some of these activities, uh, to me, uh, they, they really were uh, very impressive. <coughs> They didn't have the protection of the crown, as I said earlier. And uh, uh, the island, uh, the, yes? Oh, what era would you say that was the time that Puerto Rico was kind of forgotten by Spain? Oh, yeah, th this was in the, actually the uh, 16th, 17th century. Um, and we'll talk briefly about that later. It was in 1815 when things began to change with La Cédula de Gracia, some agreement to, uh, um, for men, uh, immigration in Puerto Rico in the 19th century, but that was 1815. Uh, so here there were hurricanes, there were droughts, uh, invasions from the Caribbean Indians, pirates, uh, as well as tropical diseases. And uh, so what happened was that uh, the inhabitants, and here now we're beginning to have a mix, you know. The Puerto Ricans didn't emerge until late in the 19th century. That's why uh, when the Spaniards uh, landed in, in Puerto Rico, Puerto Rico, the, its name was Boiques, uh, and then eventually became Boinquen, and now Puerto Ricans, uh, we call each other Boricua. And it's a kind of word that came from that time. Uh, so what, what they did was, the Crown didn't uh, think of them. Uh, they they took re uh, refuge in their personal religion, again separate from the church. Um, and that is uh, something that it has continued uh, through the uh, religious popular culture in, in Puerto Rico, even after with the churches. Uh, still there is some of that uh, in the island. Uh, any comment or question at this point? Okay. Uh, now, around the 1700s, uh, and we're going to really talk about the Santos soon. Uh, uh, what happens at that time was that uh, there were uh, uh, moments when uh, they had some visions of, uh, 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 they had some visions of uh, uh, the population of having uh, a, a, degree, a degree of support because population, although it was very sparse, but it was growing, but still we were not talking about um, having these dwellings like small towns. Uh, it had not happened like that um, <coughs> yet. Uh, they, but they were religious, and then what happened was that they, they needed images. And these images that they wanted to have, they were um, a, a different than the ones that they would see 
in, in the chapels, if any went to a chapel or, or a church, thinking of San Juan, uh, they, they, they didn't have uh, those uh, models. So they began, um, uh, it was just uh, <coughs> the inhabitants, uh, all, of course, they did everything, the carpenters, uh, uh, they, they dealt with, with wood, and then people began to ask for, hey, I need a, a, a saint to pray to uh, in my house. Uh, that's why this is a household use. You see, that's why the size is small. Never for a chapel or, or for a church. That, that is also really very important. That's why you see always the size of, of uh, in the tradition of Puerto Rico, uh, for the most part, uh, the santos are uh, small, uh, four and a half to 10 inches, uh, sometimes smaller, and now even more smaller. Uh, and that. Uh, uh, but it is because of the changes, uh, sociological changes. <coughs> in the, more than religious, to me, when I see the Santos, it's a soci sociological issue more than a religious one. And then they needed to have some references. And they went around and they tried to, to get them. And then possible ones here, uh, as you see, the, the woodcut prints of saints coming from Spain, you could see. And this has a touch of uh, Baroque there. Uh, but they, they needed whatever they had. Uh, and then it's, it's very interesting to see some of these uh, santos. So sometimes uh, a person who wanted to have a santo that could hear him or her. So the carver got uh, a santo, and the eyes were really big in proportion to the rest of, of the uh, <laughs> body because it's a that santo is looking at me. Uh, the same thing, oh, I want my santo to hear me. And then you find uh, santos with <laughs> huge ears. Uh, so you know that it's just that uh, um, the person who prays to the santo wanted to be heard. You know? So uh, we will see here that um, all the proportions are really arbitrary, depending on of the knee, and, and you could see here uh, on and off. Here, I this is a St. Paul for talking about the proportions now. And uh, to me, I wanted to emphasize the book and not the sword. So I, I made a faint, small sword, but look at the book and the big hand as compared to the uh, right hand, uh, and that's. And then here you will see that it's also something that it happened with the Romanesque, and we're going to get uh, to that point. Uh, and across the board you will see they're big-headed, and uh, for the most part, not always, but th those are important. You know, there were other the prints uh, uh, in color from Spain uh, and Mexico. Here, this is another rendering of Our Lady of uh, Montserrat painted differently, you know. So which one is the original one? I don't know. You know, I have both. Uh, it's the only thing that I, that I can say. And then there were a few church uh, <coughs> images that, that, they would, uh, that they would have gone uh, uh, to see. The, the, the Santos at the time, of course, did not have uh, any sophistication uh, in their skills. <coughs> they, they did what they did and they carved what they carved, yet they manipulated the wood and the knife um, with intuition in the midst of the physical isolation. So that intuition helped them keep going throughout uh, the centuries. Um, there are very few carvings in existence prior to 17, uh, 50s uh, in Puerto Rico. Uh, they used to call these uh, carvings first uh, Santeros Erudito, which is the educated um, expert uh, Santero. Uh, but that was before the, the emergence of the Espada family in San Germán uh, a few decades later. So, um, uh, it's interesting here in, in the 1750s what is happening also now in Puerto Rico in relation to 
uh, de Santos and, and San Germán. Uh, and of course, San Germán is located um, in the south uh, western region of Puerto Rico. Uh, and it rebuilt, actually, uh, San Juan as a center uh, of interaction with Spain as it was the administrative seat um, of the western part of the state. So there was a San Juan and there, is, uh, there was San Germán, the division. And here, um, pretty iconic, this is uh, the Church of Portacelli. Uh, it was built, started to be built in, in 1606 by the Dominicans, not the, Fran the Franciscans. And uh, uh, it went in disrepair, and in the uh, 1980s, uh, it was uh, restored. And uh, this is uh, uh, the inside of the church. And now it is a museum. Anytime you are in Puerto Rico, uh, try to go. It's, it's just worth uh, seeing. I mean, it's a, that is your town. <laughs> but, uh, it's uh, in this town, uh, uh, the two main carvers of the Espada family uh, were born. Uh, Felipe. Felipe is the father. Uh, he was born in 1754, and uh, and he died in 1818. Uh, and his son Tiburcio Espada, uh, he, died, he was born in 1794, and uh, he was uh, he died in uh, 1852. And both of them were born in, in this historic town. You could see. Uh, how natural both, uh, these are both from uh, Felipe Espada. Uh, this one is uh, the same to get dressed, that's why you see just the arms. Um, and uh, uh, this is, a, of course, by the attribute, you know that this is a Franciscan priest, and if you have a child, anybody knows which one is, what saint? It's San Anthony. Uh, Something important, had it had, for instance, a, a bird uh, or a dove uh, uh, or a dog, it would have been in St. Francis at this time. But three, four hundred years ago, uh, St. Francis uh, was um, uh, depicted, the attribute of St. Francis was a skull of a human being because uh, that meant that he was able to triumph of, uh, over death. And that's how it was. Something here, it's, you can see that the, uh, San Anthony here is painted blue, not brown. And that is because uh, all these old Santos, uh, Franciscans, uh, uh, Santos in the island and also in South America. Uh, they're painted blue. And the reason is because they were missionaries. So if they remain in Europe, their dress is the way, uh, the, the way we see it uh, today, which is uh, uh, brown, dark brown, uh, but not so in uh, Latin America. And in other places, but now we're talking about Latin America. Uh, and it was not until 1890 that then all the order, uh, all these Franciscans, um, they wore the uh, dark brown uh, cats, so their, their habit. So here we have uh, the work of uh, Tiburcio, the, the son of uh, uh, Felipe. Uh, you will see how natural they look. Uh, you could almost see it uh, as coming from Europe, uh, uh, the way it was presented. Uh, they were really, uh, they excelled for their work, uh, the Espada family. And not only did they uh, carve, but then they actually worked in altars, uh, they, uh, of churches. Uh, they wrote a sacred music uh, also um, and uh, they have found 
uh, evidence of their work, not only in Santa Isabel, which is not that far from, uh, well, actually, it is really far from Santa Isabel, so, uh, no, yeah, but in the south uh, of, of, the, of this family. Uh, and even they say the cathedral in Ponce, and that I haven't heard that it has been uh, proven. But, but that has been happening. Uh, here you will see the classical naturalism. It's just a classic, very oriented, um, um, like in Europe. Uh, and uh, they seem like experts uh, think that uh, they actually have to have some uh, academic training in their formative years. Uh, we cannot forget that many of the um, uh, many monks and priests, they actually were also carvers, among other things. Um, and then, but what happened here, this is uh, the beautiful day, Immaculate Conception. Um, uh, but that classical naturalism uh, of the spada carvings uh, could have suggested that their images would have uh, become uh, immediate models for the next generation of carvers. But that was not the case. The next generation of Santeros rejected the Espada style and the new artistic conception widely shared by other Santos through all. So here, uh, this is not the Espada uh, from the Espada family. This one is uh, from um, Francisco Rivera. Uh, um, this is around the, well, he was born in a, in 1840 in uh, Islas Canarias, Canary Islands. And uh, that family of six, seven generations of Santo Carvers, uh, it was the first one. Uh, uh, they live uh, up in the mountains, so that also talking about even more separation uh, from uh, the coast. Uh, and in the areas of Orocovis, Rosal, uh, Barranquitas, uh, Norovis also. Uh, here, when we see the Rivera group, they, you saw the, the first one, which was uh, Francisco Rivera, but then they were in transition to the new way of looking at the carving of the Santos. And uh, we're talking about the middle of uh, the 1800s. And again, these, these dates are arbitrary, because depending on where you were, uh, in what town, things were happening and in others were not. But these ones uh, are also from the Rivera family. Uh, and uh, you will begin to see some features. Again, by uh, the attribute, you know which one uh, is who? I don't know if anybody recognizes the first one to the left. It's a fish and it's an angel. So, well, hmm? yeah, Rafael, Rafael. Yeah, he is. Uh, uh, that is. Uh, if you see um, any Rafael. angel and he has a fish, forget it. It's Rafael. He's an angel. <laughs> <laughs> uh, now, uh, as a contrast, here to the right. Um, who do you think that Santo might be? See? Santiago. Santiago? Well. I saw it because of that. Yeah. That's, that's an important point. Thank you for bringing that up. Uh, okay. Any other? OK, let's a point of clarification. I know when you're talking about the outfit. You know uh, the outfit of um, uh, the same to the right, look at the hem uh, of, of the outfit. Uh, that was the usual medieval uh, outfit for, for a male. And they, from the Middle Ages on, they began to uh, just dress them. And Puerto Rico normally worked like that, but because of the uh, images that they had. Uh, and they copied in Puerto Rico, several of them were uh, medieval. And that's why you see 
uh, that kind of, of uh, outfit. Uh, but how how will we uh, figure out uh, who this saint is? Is there is any way to do it? No. Why? Because unlike Raphael, there is no attribute. He lost one hand. Say that again? He lost one hand. You will see it could be a Joseph. Uh, it could be uh, the other hand if he had a, a, the Bible, a book. Uh, could be St. Paul. If, uh, if we were to have uh, a key, St. Peter, St. Pedro, see, the attribute is what makes the name of the Santos. And here we're talking about different families in Puerto Rico about the Santos. But in reality, the vast majority of Santos in Puerto Rico, we don't know. They are anonymous because nobody knows who carved them. I mean, there is some. Um, in Santo de la Cordillera, you know, the same from uh, the mountains in, uh, uh, in Puerto Rico, because it has no name, but then they have seen some Santos which uh, some people can come. So and they, they have grouped them, but they don't know who uh, has uh, carved them. And again, the vast majority of the carved Santos in Puerto Rico, we don't know uh, who carved them. Uh, now, we're going back to uh, Spain here in Catalonia, talking about uh, the, the vision of uh, uh, how the saints uh, were perceived. Who is this guy? <laughs> look, look at it deeper than if you can. Uh, yeah, he's in the cross, but he's not St. Peter, which was upside down, or St. Uh, Andrew, which was in the cross, uh, which was an X, and then, but yeah, this is uh, Jesus, uh, again, Romanesque, uh, from Catalonia, and he ha he's dressed, and you can see. Uh, look at his head, and uh, he shows any sign of pain in his expression. In his eyes. Say that again? In the of his eyes. Do you think that his eyes show? His eyes are big. Yeah. <laughs> well, actually, the, yeah, you, you, you are distant. The eyes are small, and then it has this white thing around them. You it's know? Uh, yeah. But that time, there was no expression in, in the Santos uh, that they carved in the Romanesque period. And that is actually one of the features that in Puerto Rico was absorbed. And for the most part, you see a Satan, we'll see uh, uh, soon, that they are in pain, like uh, Mother Dolorosa, a knife, uh, seven knives sometimes, and you see a smile. Uh, it's a, um, no, no, I'm sorry, not a smile, a blank face, because it doesn't reflect the expression that uh, uh, that image has. Uh, in my mind, allows a person who sees it to bring his or her own emotions to that particular scene. Here, again, uh, from Spain, uh, look at some. Uh, here, I I think that the sculpture uh, at the left, uh, is the carving is um, from. Uh, Catalonia, uh, because uh, San Raymond Donatus, because there is a symbol of uh, the mercenaries in in Catalonia. Perhaps, perhaps not. The one to the right is uh, from Escola <coughs> Puerta de las Platerías in uh, uh, Santiago de Compostela, uh, Cathedral. Uh, uh, David playing uh, the instrument. Uh, you will see that in terms of emotion, there is no emotion either way, uh, uh, pleasure or, or pain. Uh, going back to these uh, uh, virgins, you could see both of them also from Spain. If you look at them, slim, uh, 
and uh, they may or not be or may not be uh, the version of uh, Montserrat because it was a style that they had. But again, it is uh, direct, stern, no contact. You will see mother and child; they never look at each other. Um, they were like out of this world. I mean, after all, they were saints. You know, they were out there in heaven, and they didn't look human. Um, uh, no, they didn't represent human emotions, and this is what I should, should have said. Yeah. Uh, here now, you will see those, and look at the, the expressions of, of these uh, in, in Puerto Rico. Uh, these are samples from Puerto Rico. The one to the left is uh, from um, Benigno Soto. We can see others of him. And I, I have... This one here is, is from him. Um, look at the hand. I mean, the, it, it was characteristic of this uh, carver. And and look at Christ. Uh, almost looks like an knapsack or something. Look, at this is small. Uh, but then look at the face. And look at that face. It's almost like, like a pear. The shape of, of a bear. <coughs> it is a, an immediate way of, of uh, identifying uh, Don Benigno Soto, which was uh, the end of the 19th century, early 20th century. And he um, was very prolific. So uh, uh, they have a lot of uh, uh, saints. Uh, he, he was able to carve. And again, using uh, Cedar, mostly female cedar, cedro hembra. Uh, what happens is that it's soft uh, when carving, but and it has a fragrance. We all like the cedar uh, uh, scent. Ah, but if you're sanding and then they come to your lips, you see how bitter it is actually for the lips, you know, the taste. Uh, and uh, that's why uh, this uh, in Puerto Rico actually a humid tropical island uh, and so many santos have survived and it is because of that in fact in many uh, wooden houses uh, and i remember that as a child uh, in the 50s going up to puerto rico when my father was born uh, the wooden houses and they had pieces of uh, cedar male or, or female behind the doors because that that will uh, it was an insect repellent you know, in their minds, because insects didn't like it. But look at the positions of them again, frontal, looking in front, pretty much like the Romanesque period. Uh, and we actually um, have continued to do so. There is some movement in some uh, of the uh, new uh, uh, Carvers like 15 years ago, they started with something. It's putting some smile in face of the Santos. I, I set my limits there. <laughs> I, I wouldn't do that uh, because to me that it is not part of the tradition. And, and then trying to make it uh, in a different way from my perspective, and that is a bias. Eh? And other people will do it, and very happy. And, and that is really uh, great. Look, this is another example of the Rivera family. Uh, uh, this is uh, the Holy Family. Look at the hat that I don't like so much. <laughs> <laughs> she does not, actually. <laughs> um, any comment or? Uh, I feel that I'm just talking and talking. Uh, I'm waiting for some interaction. Uh, so, I am not pushing. <laughs> yes. I was wondering, you mentioned that the wood um, to change to cedar, but what about the paint and the, I know that in, in Russian iconographic back statues, they use a lot of precious metal in the painting yes. of, the, of the statues. So, what about the... the Okay, you're contrasting uh, the icons from Russia mm -hmm. and uh, and the uh, and and here the carvings. Yeah, carvings. But what kind of paint? The, the, the kind of paints. Yes. Do they change over time? 
Yes. Uh, uh, yes. No, it's interesting. It's, uh, by the way, uh, if anybody wants to be really impressed, uh, in Clinton, north of Worcester, they have uh, the Museum of Russian Icons. They have been there for about 10, 12 years. We have gone once a year already when they're in May. I don't want to go again. Usually in the fall, uh, it is quite uh, an experience right there in the town. Uh, and I get a block down. You walk two blocks down. There is a museum. It's a gallery of African art. Amazing. Over a thousand pieces. Um, so it, it, and the, this is all here in North Clinton, Massachusetts. The way they use, yeah, in Puerto Rico, for the most part, uh, all the carvings were painted. Uh, I'm talking about before uh, the last part of the 20th century. Uh, they were uh, painted. Uh, and what kind of paint they used? Whatever they had available. If they were painting the house, that's the color because that's what they had. You know, they didn't have loads or uh, on the to go and get their stuff. It's whatever they had. Nails, which is really damaging for the, the piece uh, when it rusts, uh, uh, they use that. Um, they prepare their own colors when they also with uh, uh, seeds of, of plants, vegetable colors that they also uh, got involved with that. So were the colors chosen for symbolic <coughs> purposes? No, at the time it was whatever they had available. Mm -hmm. You know, it was not symbolic. Because also, uh, even today, uh, there is value judgment when we talk about symbolic, symbolic for you, and then what about symbolic for me, or someone else. Uh, but there are some things who have been pretty permanent uh, in terms of color. And it is, for instance, usually the Virgin is, it has, uh, uh, the robe is white, or reddish, perhaps, or pink, and, uh, and then they have uh, covered with a blue color, mm -hmm. and as you can see here. So have the colors kind of held the same importance as an attribute almost in some regards? <coughs> that is such a difficult question. When I say the Virgin, like the Immaculate Conception, for the most part, is light blue and white. However, we saw the Immaculate Conception, the glorious Immaculate Conception of the, uh, Francisco Rivera, and it was green, and the, the colors that he had available, that's what he used, you know? Because there was no one to say this, or also the choices of color. Today, most uh, carvers use acrylic, <coughs> and for them to be, uh, uh, the color to be brighter, they use gesso. Uh, perhaps, I'm going to do it now, my God. Uh, I was going to do it earlier when I did it. Look at this process, you know, from the block of wood, then you have here the uh, icon and the, the sculpture that you want to carve. Then you cut it and then you begin, of course, to use the, uh, the knife. Uh, and then if you bring it to this level. And then here, because I didn't want to put a fourth uh, icon here, and not uh, for the carving, I divided this in two. Then you put gesso, uh, and what that does is that it is just to cover uh, the, the pores uh, to avoid absorption of the painting. So some, actually some carvers, they don't put gesso, and then you will see that uh, the colors uh, that they use, they're very subdued. Why? Because the wood would absorb most of it. So to prevent that from happening, then you use the gesso. And uh, it makes a difference. And again, here the attribute, you know, if it's a key, if he has a key, what is the, what is it? Yeah, San Pedro, uh, St. Peter. Uh, that is always, always uh, an important, um, uh, when you think of saints, think of attributes. It is ex extremely important because in that way you can recognize the or not, you know. So, uh, okay, here, uh, still, you know, we're talking about uh, the, the, the native style. Uh, now, 
uh, we're going to be talking about those saints that only exist in Puerto Rico outside the Catholic Church. The Church does not recognize them. Uh, uh, one is, the first one is the Virgin of the Kings. You see the Virgin de los Reyes. She's, uh, the attribute for that Virgin is what? The star. And what else? The, 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 the three small, you know, sometimes they are even smaller and sometimes they are embedded in the hem of the Virgin. I mean, it just it depends. The creativity is uh, amazing. Uh, but here you see, um, again, there is bright color because of the gist. Without it, you know, and it's acrylic, it's not gold. Uh, the gold, I mean, is not uh, oil. Uh, and the traditional color of the Virgin, which is blue and, and white. Uh, you will never see this in a, in a Catholic church because it's not recognized. Uh, the other one is, what is the Virgin here? We have talked about it a little bit today. Yeah, Montserrat, Our Lady of Montserrat. However, in Puerto Rico, it was created in a different way. You see there is a man and an ox in front. So without the man and the ox, it will be the uh, Lady of Montserrat, no? Uh, the de Montserrat. Uh, but now this is a, a new scene, and it was created um, in Puerto Rico, and this is, it goes back to the 1500s when they, they know the name, Gerardo, now I forget his last name, uh, he is a basket uh, maker, and he was uh, getting uh, the material for uh, his basket. And then suddenly there is an ox who comes uh, to to hit him, and he then implores uh, uh, Montserrat uh, to save him. And then he appeared. That is a mythology, of course. Uh, and and she appeared to him, and then. Um, the ox uh, uh, falls. And since that time, and this was in the town of Hormiguero in Puerto Rico. Uh, again, not far uh, from San Germán and then later Aguada that we will see. Uh, uh, that area was really rich in, in history in the country. <coughs> um, so, only in Puerto Rico, the Milagro de Hormigueros, uh, the Miracle of Hormigueros, exists. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, you will never see it in the church either, uh, because the Catholic Church doesn't recognize it. Another one is uh, of uh, the Puerto Rican uh, popular, and this is uh, the religious popular culture. For instance, uh, Montserrat, uh, the Black Madonna, is the one that is the favorite uh, among uh, carvers. But the official, and that for them is, that's the official mm -hmm. virgin of, of the island, but the official uh, uh, church, uh, the, the official um, uh, uh, virgin is the Providence, Our Lady of Providence, uh, which back in 1853, it was brought from Spain, and then the bishop said, this is uh, this is going to be our uh, this virgin is going to be our patron saint, um, and uh, so that it, it is true and still is our Lady of Providence is, but then in the popular culture, the Montserrat, it, it it just works that way. Here you have another uh, scene: the three kings and the three Marys. Uh, uh, we all know, you know the significance of the kings in, in Puerto Rico. Uh, and, um, but here, the quality here is different. Uh, anybody knows about this, uh, the three Marys and the three kings? Um, again, only exists in Puerto Rico. Well, what happened was that one night, they went uh, for a party. They, they, they spend the night partying, the, the six of them, you know? Uh, and then, suddenly they realize that it's late. And uh, their parents, uh, to the women, uh, oh my God, they're going to be upset. So there was a change in the time that night. So when they got home, uh, the parents thought 
that uh, they have come earlier than they have actually gone. Of course, this is mythology, of course. But this is what, you know, when you think of popular culture, that is what happens. So again, you will never see this in, in a church or, or anywhere else in, in the world. <laughs> only in the That's why it's called Las Tres Marías and the uh, Los Tres Reyes. What is it in yeah. Oh, fire. <coughs> so they can, they can, you know, El uh, Yes, fire. just to look, to, to be able to see a knife. <laughs> so, yeah. Um, there, there are reports that they really had a good night. Maria was the Virgin Mary? No, no, oh. Maria Cleofas, Mary Magdalene, and um, hmm. another Mary that I don't remember which one is, but it was, no, no, one is not Virgin Mary. <laughs> she was not in the party. Uh, Maria <laughs> Magdalene is the one. Uh, I'm sorry? Maria Magdalene is the one. Uh, Maria, Ma yeah, Mary Magdalene. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, so, I, at least, of course, you know, this is what some people have have said about who they are, but I, uh, you, I have never heard that it's Virgin Mary. No. And then no. the, the next one is... She was um, a virgin. <laughs> she was a virgin to begin with. Yeah, Mary. not after that night. <laughs> 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 that is your assumption. <laughs> <laughs> but um, moving right along, and here we have another item uh, carving that is unique to Puerto Rico, and this is uh, uh, the Virgen del Pozo, the Virgin of the Well. Uh, it appeared in Puerto Rico, in Santa Isabel, in the town of Santa Isabel, um, in 1953. Uh, again, the church hasn't recognized uh, uh, the, the presence of it. And I remember that I was uh, in Puerto Rico, in, uh, in 2003, which was the 50th anniversary of the apparition of uh, Santa Isabel, and then I was with a close friend, uh, Carmen Camilo Mor, Rivera Lacen, I think her sister is going to be around. Uh, she's a folklorist, I mean, it's just, uh, uh, I have known her for 46 years. Um, and they say, hey, Carmen, let's go. I call her Comay, you know, she's the godmother, the godmother of Marina, our youngest daughter. He said, hey, let's go uh, to uh, Santa Isabel. He said, oh, yeah, let's see what happens there. When we got there, and that's...